everybody, and welcome back to Chapter Tactics, episode number 209. I am your host, Magikarp Usefly, also known as Matt. Uh, and uh, in this podcast, we talk about tactics and strategies to help out both new and veteran players alike. With me today, we have the very, very handsome Adameki. Hey, everybody. How are y'all doing today? That's a good intro. And on top of that, not only do we have Demeki, we also have the very, very beautiful Scarry. Why, hello. And uh, you can find me, you know where. Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds so mysterious. I'm it? intrigued. Yes. Is it an 800 number? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. It is uh, with the ever-changing winds. Of today's topic. Yeah, which is an ever-changing meta. (laughs) Ooh. 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 So um, before we start off, I just want to say that uh, John P. cannot be joining us here today because he is not here. He is in Florida Mm -hmm. uh, doing Florida Man stuff, trying to save the world, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. I don't know what he's doing in Florida, actually. I have no idea. I think it was just to celebrate the 4th of July weekend, but I hope that everybody that is listening to this podcast had a great weekend, had a good time, hung out, spent some time with some family, and if you do not celebrate the 4th of July, I still hope that you had a great weekend. Now, this episode, we are talking about how to prepare for an ever-changing meta. We all play Warhammer and... We all know that every once in a while, GW comes in like a wrecking ball and just completely demolishes everything that we know of in this game. And so we're going to be talking about how to prepare for that along uh, with our guest, Skari, here. But first, before we go into that, I think that Demeki has some knowledge that he wants to drop on us with today's Did You Know? I'm winging it. I'm just using straight off the top of my head knowledge that I have accumulated so far about Commander Farsight. <laughs> so, uh, Commander Farsight, did you know that he's the hero of Yorla and he is the protege of Commander Pure Tide? He, uses, he was taught to use the terrain uh, against his foes and the sword that his uh, battle suit carries is actually what is keeping him alive. Oh, what? Yeah. So he's like he's like Iron Man, but a sword. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that that's that's about all I know so far. Um, I I do have the book I'm looking forward or the second book I'm looking forward to reading it. But uh, I, I I know some other things, but like I've got like a plethora of information about Commander Farsight in my head, and I don't know what's true, what's false. Like I think I've read at some point. Um, one, one of the things that like, I guess enlightened him was like, he lost all of his ethereals during a battle. Mm -hmm. And that's Mm kind of like when he was like, well, maybe, maybe I should do my own thing. Maybe it's not all about this greater good stuff and I'll start my own enclaves. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know a lot about yeah, his uh, like brainwashing top. powers, uh, brainwashing powers deactivated. And then yeah. he's like, I'm going to, I don't need to follow you. I can do my own thing. Yeah. He's, he was like, Hey, I can go get my own beer. I can go <laughs> do my own stuff. I'm an adult. <laughs> the, 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 I'm an adult the, now. The, the, all of Tao's lore. Every time that I hear about it, it sounds more and more in line with how I feel like I would live my life if I was living in the 41st millennia. Yeah. 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 I, I, so. I, I, I think I would, I would live the Tao way. Mm-hmm. I think I, I definitely think so. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> onto some stuff to get excited about. Yes. <clears throat> so, uh, Age of Sigmar 3.0 launched. It's officially. here. It is here. If you haven't gotten your dominion box yet, um, good luck. I, uh, hopefully that you, you can still get them, but, uh, we have gotten our dominion box, um, with the other one on the way. Yeah. We got some storm cast eternals and some, what is it? Uruks. Uruks. Uruks that we're building up right now. So hopefully you guys, uh, get your chance in playing in some Ada Sigmar. If you are already running a chaos army, then you're already there. So go you're ahead smart. and play it out. It's, a. Uh, I've, I know that Scar, you've been playing a lot of Age of Sigmar. What do you think about it so far? With 3.0? I've been playing. I've played a few games of 3.0. I really like it. It's very similar to 40k 9th edition in like scoring, 
right? Mm-hmm. So the game's completely different, but I, I'm a huge fan of their mission system. Like, the way they have the secondaries and the primary scoring, the way you have to build, like, a mission into, like, your list building. Um, and it's, like, a really tactical, like, game when it comes to, like, scoring points. And I really like that aspect of it because you have to have... You have to think throughout the whole game. You have to pick the right secondaries at the right time. You can't double up on them throughout the game. So it's different, and it's... Yeah, it, it's a good thinker. Like, you'll enjoy it if you haven't tried it yet. You know, the way that you're telling me about the secondaries, it kind of reminds me of how Necrons uh, play with their, mm-hmm. like, with their... The dynasty, uh, yeah. Yeah, their dynasties or whatever. Yeah. Is it, the, like, the same uh, thing? protocols, yeah. Yeah. Is it, like, mm-hmm. the same thing? Well, you don't get to choose them either, or, but there's a list of, like, you know, seven or eight secondaries in mm-hmm. the GT mission mm-hmm. pack, um, and there's, like, six in the regular pack. You have a five-turn game, and then the beginning of your player turn... You basically declare, I'm going to try and do this. Oh. And by the end of your player turn, you have to try and do it. But you can't repeat any of that list. So one of them is like, have the most models in the middle of the table. Like, literally like an Oath of Moment style thing. And then you pick that, and then you go, okay, so I scored my points or I didn't. Another one is, this turn I'm going to try kill your warlord, right? And you either do or you don't in that turn, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to try and kill something that's in my deployment zone. Right. Yeah. I'm. I'm gonna try kill something in your in your deployment zone. Right. And so you have to like you need to be able to pick multiple ones throughout the game. Right. Because right. you can't just pick the same one over and over. And uh, uh, and it makes it very interesting. No, so it's no. kind of like match play from eighth, right, with the cards, but but instead oh, of it being Nelson, random, yeah, from war, yeah, instead of it being randomized with cards, you actually get to pick. That's kind of cool. Mm. Yeah, no, no, and t- then you, and t- it's cool because you can set it up and then pick it for the next time, and you can do stuff like, I'm gonna try kill your warlord, and then your opponent's like, I'm gonna declare my, you know, my mightiest hour for my warlord, so he's mm-hmm. harder to kill this turn, you know, that sort of thing. So they can like try and like stifle you and in, in, in things like that. So it's neat. Now, do, do you think that 3.0 is can be on the same level as 40k when it comes to like being competitive? I think the competitive AOS community is quite competitive. I think what is well, more I mean, prevalent like, is that there's a yeah. lot more direct rock, paper, scissors in Age of Sigmar, mm. right? So yeah. if you build a list that's really good, again, like to do like damage or that has good armor or whatever, there's a list out there that does only mortal wounds and would like murder your army. Oh, okay. Right? You want to build like a super, like, like, you know, spell heavy army. There's a there's an army out there that's just going to shut down your spells, right? Mm-hmm. So there's very much a rock paper scissors element to it that I find a lot more than in 40k. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because 40k is very you have to be able to deal with everything, and even though there is kind of rock paper scissors, like you could still get by with it, and it's mm-hmm. fine. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So we have that. Uh, also, you Cheridan coming in soon. Yeah, uh, boy. That's gonna be exciting. You got the new Bellacore rules. You also yeah. got some. I believe there's Chaos Space Marine rules in there. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be mm-hmm. cool. That's coming out. Uh, also, some tournaments that are still happening. Uh, upcoming this weekend, Dice Hammer. Uh, mm-hmm. That's happening in California. Over Bricky in, will be there. Yes, Bricky will be there. And uh, also, Lone Star Open. Tickets are still on sale. So if you want to go check that out and head on over to Dallas, Texas and play some Warhammer. Pew, pew. <laughs> uh, you could do so as well. That's actually this month too. It's at the end yep. of the month. Yep, yep, yep. Now I think that we have gone over mm-hmm. uh, some stuff uh, that uh, that a uh, uh, segue alert. All right, here we go. <laughs> Let's get on to the main topic of this uh, of this podcast. But before we do that, this show is brought to you by FrontlineGaming.org, where you can get amazing game mats for not just your 40K games, but also any tabletop game out there. Purchase miniatures at a discount and join some of the largest 40K events in the industry. They also have the largest 40K podcasting network in the business with shows like Signals from the Frontline, Chapter Tactics, which you're listening to right now, 40K Game Changers, 40K Stat Center, Grim After Dark, and so much more. That's FrontlineGaming.org, or you can click on the link in the description of this podcast and on uh, everywhere that you can get us in social media goodie forms in your ear holes and stuff, all you... All you Zoomers out there with your different technology thingies. Your Fache books and y- tweeters. Yeah, your audio book stuff, iTunes and <laughs> whatever. The kids, you're on playing it on your Zooms. 
and you're <laughs> <injured. laughs> <laughs> All right. So today's topic, we're talking about how to prepare for an ever-changing meta. Got some stu- uh, Got a little line for you guys. Uh, if you guys want to close your eyes as right. I whisper sweet nothings into your ears. So no army is safe when it comes to the GW nerf hammer. And no army is complete without their buff hammer either. So how do you keep your army ready for the upcoming changes? And how do you deal with getting your army nerfed or buffed? Now, Skari, I know that uh, you recently are... Uh, you, you, you were dealt a little bit of a nerf um, with your Drukari from GW, nerfing them a little bit with your liquefiers and all that nonsense. Uh, how, how does it feel coming from a, a recently nerfed army and comparatively to how it felt in 8th edition when you would get nerfed or buffed? Well, it, it's a funny question you may ask because I didn't really use the liquefier guns. I was uh, so It's not my style of gameplay, so I didn't mm-hmm. really feel the nerf at all. And I feel that's one of the strengths is I tend to play stuff that's counter meta. <laughs> and yeah. then when it does get nerfed, it doesn't affect my game way that I've been learning how to play the, the, the match. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people out there are feeling the nerf of the liquefier guns, but to be honest, Dark Eldar are, are still incredibly strong. So it doesn't mm. really change the faction as a whole, it just changed like a specific build that was seen over and over and over in competitive play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I think that's the same thing that's happening with like Admec because recently Admec got their FAQ mm-hmm. where they changed the sterilizer so then they can no longer just keep coming in and out without any interaction at all. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's good. That's good. I, I Honestly, I feel like that GW is doing a really good job with uh, their nerfs and buffs. What do you guys think? Yeah, I just, um, I'm, I'm just more so curious as to how they didn't find some of this stuff during playtesting because like, that's the QA portion, at least I think it is, for these books. All you have to do is give a book to like a competitive gaming team or something like that, and they will find everything in that book that is mm-hmm. abusable. Mm-hmm. And then you just go, okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. And then go, you know, we should probably address this before we release it. Yep. You know, but a lot of the times, like play testers, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not a play tester. I don't really like know, know much about the play testing yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah. What I do know is that they sort of like, a lot of the times playtesters don't have a lot of time to work with specific rules. Yep. And a lot of the times the rules that they get aren't necessarily in like a, con- like a, like a group thing. They send them like tidbits mm-hmm. individually mm-hmm. and not combined. So they're working with, in- with, they're working with individual <laughs> mechanics more than like with the whole thing throughout the process a yeah. lot of the time. Yeah. yeah. And um, like, I-, I think that yeah. that's because, you know, you have uh your printable codexes, right? Yeah. So they can't really send you the finished codex. I guess like maybe they could send you like a binder and like <laughs> some printed paper of it, but all I'm picturing mm-hmm. is a dude sitting at a table, like they're they're all in a conference table, right? A whole bunch of people and a guy goes, Oh, I have an idea. And he writes it down in a post-it note and then it, they just pass that around. <laughs> <That's> just... <laughs> they're like, here's this new rule, test this out. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? It's good? It's good? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Send it to everybody. <laughs> do it. Uh. <laughs> test it, test it. So this is the rule, okay? Just these birds at the end of the turn, you can just move them up off the board. <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. That you know, that'd be really cool. You know, we're doing that with the mechanic, and that's and that's like the end of the development process. Yeah. Of that rule specifically of that stratagem. Yeah. And then they go because it would it sounds cool, right? Yeah. But then like you know, you know, you get a competitive admec player reading that and going, wait a second, <laughs> that means I can. End of the turn. What does that imp- like? What does that mean? Oh, I can do all my secondaries. I can do like my actions. I can complete a whole bunch of stuff and then disappear. And then I can come in in that turn, do that, and then disappear. So you can't physically interact with me. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Thank you, game. Thank, Workshop. thank, thank you, yeah. Raw. Thank you, Raw. I, re- I really appreciate <laughs> this so much. <laughs> now, yeah, now, exactly. Now th- th- that brings up a good question: is you know, you have something like that. Now, there are people that bought those sterilizers specifically for, you know, doing that, that type of interaction. Yeah. What do you do after mm-hmm. that is no longer a thing, right? Serves like, I mean, like, you right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, like... You paint them and get them ready for apocalypse yeah. matches. <laughs> like, do you, well, do you the, still the, keep the, them the, in the, the meta? Unit, the thing is, you have to, like, take a step back. That unit mm-hmm. is no is not, like... It's not a bad unit. Yeah, yeah. You can still get points off of it. It just means your opponent can actually deal with the unit. It's you don't have like an invulnerable unit anymore. Yeah, Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but, you know, uh, for people that see these nerfs that come in for their armies, and you're going to be seeing them, like, a lot as your new codexes come out, and then you have your chapter approved points coming in and everything like that. How do you transition yourself into understanding that eventually these models that you have are no longer going to be good in a competitive sense? Like, how do you deal with that scar besides just buying the entire army? <laughs> like, every model in the army. Every model. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I've been playing Dark Eldar for the last 20 years or 15 years or something like that. You know, I own every model in the army. So yeah. I, my army's very edition or meta proof. Because I literally can just pick and choose what is good at that point in time, and I don't have to go and spend more money, or maybe I need to like add another vehicle or two here or there. But a lot of the times, you need to look at the thing that stays the most consistent throughout an edition, mm -hmm. and sort of adapt to that specific thing. So a lot of the times, what stays the most consistent are like the missions or the way you score points. That sort of thing. Yeah. So instead of like focusing specifically on like how what composition my army is going to do, and then play my list based on that composition, you look at how how do I need to play the game to score points, and if my goal is to win by scoring points, you know how can I stop my opponent from scoring points and win from and win with scoring more points. And a lot of the times, the list you might build, you know, depending on like how the meta is at the time, will change. And it it's a lot easier to build to the mission than having to build to, like, your unit strengths and weaknesses in a pinch. Yeah. yeah. I can feel that. How do you feel about it? What, in, what, the same term? Well, yeah. like, for for Death Guard, I mean, like, I I kind of... De Death Guard just feels like they're in such a good, good spot right now. It's I feel like it's one of the only codexes that Codex Creep, as we've talked before, hasn't really affected it. Um and every unit still feels like it, it serves a purpose for that army, right? The the only unit that like I, I feel like meta wise doesn't fit is actually the plague marine. Like everything else has a place. The plague marine's kind of like you don't really need to take a plague marine, right? Mm -hmm. So take poxwalkers instead. Yeah, just take poxwalkers instead with a bunch of death route terminators. Have a good time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and. You know, and and with every codex, like and throughout the edition, there are going to be hits and misses. Yeah, like you're going to have a unit that you really love that's really iconic for that faction that you love, like mm -hmm. the Plague Marine. Like you can't really talk Death Guard without being like the iconic Plague Marine, right? Mm -hmm. However, you're right. Sometimes that Plague Marine is like, well, even though it's the poster child for that faction, it doesn't really fit into this faction right now. Yeah, right, because yeah. it's either too expensive or other units in the codex outshine it rules wise. Yep. And that's another thing that you have to keep in mind is don't be too attached. If you want to play and keep up with the meta, like competitively speaking, you can't be too attached to what you think is cool. Yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. it's a really sad um, realization when you have, when you come to grips with that, like, there, there's yeah. a very big difference between playing the game competitively mm -hmm. and playing the game uh, casually, right? Yes. When you're playing yeah. the game casually, you can literally just throw whatever you want on the board, and it's fine. You're, you're playing... Make up rules if you want. Yeah, like, yeah. Literally. Yeah. The, it's set up that you could literally just make up rules mm -hmm. and play whatever you want. You know, bring two Vindicators. You know, why not? Yeah, why not? Why <laughs> yeah. not? It's fine. Like that, And then it's, it's fine. And then you can play Apocalypse and just play with all your cool models. But then when you're looking at a competitive aspect and um, when you're going to like different tournaments, you're going to different events, right? You have to be able to understand that not every unit that you have, like the unit that you think is cool, mm -hmm. can't really perform competitively, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like look at uh, a Carnifex, right? Like yeah. that's like a Tyranid, that's like one of the biggest Tyranid iconic models is a Carnifex. Absolute garbage. Yep. Can't run them. Uh, but, you know, you have to understand, but just because you can't run doesn't mean that the army is bad or anything. You just You're have right. to kind of adapt, you know, yep. you have to adapt to what, uh, what the meta is and, uh, kind of like, I, I feel like, and, uh, Scar, you can, uh, you can elaborate on this more. I feel like that the best way to kind of make sure that you're future proofing yourself is not by looking at what lists are really good at the time for your specific army, but looking at how you can play your army in your own style mm -hmm. uh, that counteracts how other people are playing the top tier armies. Yep. Uh, uh, you're yeah. right. Like, it, it, And it's, 
The thing is, this is such a broad topic because mm -hmm. it branches out into more than just like, do you want to prepare for a shifting meta? You have to have a mentality that sort of like doesn't necessarily agree with change, right? Because nobody likes to be changed, mm -hmm. but we all like thrive with change, if that makes sense, yeah. Yeah. right? Like we, we grow and we develop. So, you know, you, you need to have the mentality of accepting that things are going to change and being flexible, mm -hmm. right? In terms of like list building, you know, if e keeping your fingers in the meta, like using best coast pairings, taking a look at like the, the, the top list that people are playing, and then going back to your personal codex or your collection even mm -hmm. and going, hmm, you know, what sort of units could I bring that could fill a gap in this list or deal with a specific unit that I'm seeing is popping up in the meta more frequently right now? And a lot of the times you'll be surprised. Like you'll go, you'll reread your codex and read like a relic or a stratagem or a unit ability and you'll kind of do a double take and be like, that would actually be really useful in yeah. a very specific situation that's happening in the meta right now. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I, we were and, kind of, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that's, that's, so it's, it's about, it's about looking at what you have with a fresh, with a fresh mindset and a framework based on like what you're seeing is happening or a game you've had and being adaptable and being like, Ooh, cool. That, I, that'd be cool. Everybody's playing psychers. I have this one relic that's anti psyker that nobody ever uses but it's actually really cool, mm -hmm. considering now everybody's running psychers, right? Oh, so like, <laughs> mortal wounds are a thing. Let me just pull out my black templars real quick. <laughs> Let's just well, before I knew death guard, <laughs> what, what was the psyker? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah what, what, exactly. What did you want to plug into there? So, well, it's like he was saying. You know, you're you're going back and you're digging through the codex, and we kind of like talked about this uh, after the match on Saturday between me, you, and Bricky, right? Mm -hmm. Where uh, I feel like some of the Space Marine players right now are the, the ones that have their codices or codexes, however you want to say it. Um, they, they're they like, oh, my army's in a bad spot. Like, oh, Blood Angels is in a bad spot. But I, I feel like most of the time, they're so focused on their supplement-specific units inside that they kind of forget, well, you have a whole nother codex with all these units that still get all your buffs, they just don't get those specific buffs that those other units get that you can probably use in your army that would actually help and benefit, right? Yeah. And I and I feel like a lot of a lot of Space Marine players are just like tunnel visioned into their supplement and they're not actually looking at the Space Marine codex itself and the units in there and like how to incorporate those units into their army and also be effective. Like Hell Blasters. Hell Blasters would be great. For Dark Angels, especially with the stratagem where they deal more damage with plasma weapons, right? So, like, it's st it's stuff like that that I just feel like people people are just tunnel vision into the supplement, and they and they they just see that one particular unit that they want to make work, but it just doesn't fit with the meta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know what's actually pretty interesting about like this topic is that. And a, a lot of actually the ways that you play 40k, especially competitively, it, a lot of the topics, it, it, it's not about like, this is a plug and play. You pick this unit, you win. Easy, done, right? It, a lot of it actually has to do with changing your mindset of how you look at the games, right? And I think that that's yeah. like a huge part in competitive 40K that not a lot of people really understand is that uh, the game is so... There's so much of the game out there, right? There's so much knowledge that you mm -hmm. can gain about this game. There's so many ins and outs. There's so much crazy stuff. Even now, people are still figuring out busted ways that you could play certain units, busted ways that you could play certain armies. But it's not like when when you look at playing the game competitively, it's not about what's the best unit, mm -hmm. what's the best army. I will now replicate that list and bring it to a tournament. You know, that's not that's not the point of competitive 40K. It's, it's about like un changing your mindset to mm -hmm. become more adaptable and understanding what, your weaknesses and what your uh, um, what your strengths are mm -hmm. with whatever army that you're playing. I mean, like look at someone like Richard Siegler. He can literally pick up any army and and win a tournament. You know, get like top four, right? Like it, it doesn't matter what army you're playing. If you play at such a high level and you are actually good, it doesn't. You don't have to land on this crutch of like what's the strongest army, yeah. right? And I think that that 
coincides with uh, like people who think about switching up their armies as much as possible. Now, Skari, being a uh, a pro player, how do you feel about people that switch up their armies as much as possible, depending on if they're strong or not? So in the compet- I, I'm, how do I feel? I feel conflicted, mm-hmm. to be honest. You know, because a lot of the times, you know, people come and ask for advice or whatever, and they're like, hey, I really want to, like, learn how to play a game, or I really want to learn, like, how to play this faction or whatever. And then, like, they play one game, they lose, they change their list, they play another game, they lose. They Then they go and go, ooh, okay, so Richard Siegler won this tournament with Tau, so I'm going to, like replicate his list and hope that I win and then they lose and mm-hmm. then they get dis- they get disappointed right and stuff like that now, yeah. I'll tell you right now that like with any scientific process you know if you want to do an experiment you need to have a control group that it doesn't get touched right it's mm-hmm. a control group yeah. you yeah. know what's going to mm-hmm. happen with a control group right and then in order to do an experiment you take a sort of like a, a, a like a copy of the control group and you expose it to variables mm-hmm. and based on those variables the control group will react right so then based on that information you can make like an educated guess that this control group when exposed to this variable will more than likely do this mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. now 40k we're playing a game with thousands of variables there's dice rolls right that alone that, that alone right? yeah but you have you have the dice yes okay like i say don't blame the dice but however the dice have an impact in the game yes they do rain has an impact the mission you're playing your opponent's faction not only that but the mood that you're in that mm-hmm. has an impact on how you approach the game at a competitive high level yeah right like you have to be in the zone right? Yeah. Sometimes you can have something that's affecting you that way. So all of these variables will affect the outcome of your game. One of the only things that you can keep consistent as a control group is the list that you play. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because in a game with so many variables, that's one of the only things you can truly control, which is one of the reasons why you see people do well to play either a, a, a very similar list for like a year. Mm -hmm. right like richard siegler like in 2018 went on a tear in the itc season with his triptide tau yeah right but he'd been playing that same style of list for like two years Mm -hmm. like over and over and over and just doing consistently well and then eventually got to the point where he kind of cracked the code and just went just crushed people but he kind of kept his list very very similar throughout that whole period Mm mm-hmm yeah. It's right. Like- so I, 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 I have mixed feelings. It's good to test and find things and try like adapt to the meta. But if you just constantly change your list, you're never going to find consistent results, regardless of the variables or the missions or the meta, good or bad or whatever that is thrown at you. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Demeki? Well, um, what, one thing that I, I think is kind of interesting is especially like, uh, the Australian meta and stuff reading about and listening about that before COVID is that a lot of the guys have so many armies so that they don't like people don't build against them. Right. So Mm -hmm. that they're not bringing the same list, uh, to a tournament or an event. And that way, I guess their opponents aren't building against them Mm -hmm. essentially to, to beat that list. That's why I, I know, uh, some people switch it up, especially with factions in their list. Uh, I agree with Scary though, and and the Richard Siegler thing, because like lately I've been pretty much running the same Death Guard list in the league, and it's been performing really well. And I've just been making small tweaks to the list, and and it's 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 been working. Um, maybe one day I'll crack the code. Maybe I'll go yeah, full maybe. Rain Man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> man, who would have thought that practice makes perfect? Guys? I know, right? <laughs> man, Not I just practice that. makes perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Exactly. Yeah, if you're practicing something shitty, then you're gonna have like the bad results, yeah. right? Like yeah, you yeah, want to yeah. make sure that you're practicing properly with the right mentality or all that practice is just going into learning how to do something wrong right. really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I think it, it, you know, honestly, it's like um. It's like what happens with uh, uh, with video games, yeah. right? People get into this idea that they're going to go into a game and it's going to be the exact same 
result mm-hmm. from their last game, right? You look mm-hmm. at this, it's the same thing with things like Battle Royales, with any MOBAs that you're playing or anything like that. You you go into a game and you don't you see that you can control your character, right? Mm-hmm. Think of the character as your army for 40K. You can control it and everything that you do with that army, it's all on you, right? Yeah. And then, but, uh, and then, like, you take what Scar said, with all these different variables, you're going mm-hmm. up against different people, you're in a different environment, it's a different time of day, you know, you, you have all these variables coming in to play your game, right? But when, uh, when you're not, when you're, when you're just going on autopilot, you know, you show up to your LGS and you bring in your armies and you're just like, this is the same uh, strategy that uh, I've been doing where I'm just going to put everything on the line and then just push them up and then, you know, hope mm-hmm. for the best, right? Like, that's yeah. not really practicing. That's kind of nah. just going with the flow, like just going through the motions and not really strategically, like, or not strategically, tactically analyzing how you're playing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it's about it's about positioning. It's about you know, un, like it's about you know, putting the right amount of dice or right amount of things into killing or destroying something. Yeah. And I wanted to kind of you know, you know, make a note there, Demeki, where like yes, like certain pro players, quote unquote, like for example, like John Lennon, right? Mm-hmm. Like, he'll go to a random tournament and take like this list, and then he'll go to a different one and take that list, and yeah. then like down in Australia, you have other people taking weird lists that they change frequently. Yeah. One of the things that a pro player does is they'll have played that list, even if it's from one week to another, they'll mm-hmm. probably play that list like six to seven times that week yeah. before oh, they yeah. go to the event mm-hmm. behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. right like they've tested this list even though it doesn't seem like it right or it's very similar to another list in concept and in sort of like unit roles yeah you know because if you look at a list that say like john lennon's great example he took an ultramarine list to a tournament does really well then takes a death watch tor- list to a tournament but it's very 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 similar to the concepts that he built With and included in his ultramarine list. list yeah yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's just trying out different ways. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the, the one thing that you bring up too, though, when you were talking about video games and whatnot, I think one, one thing that people tend to forget too is like when you lose, right, or die in a mm-hmm. video game, like you think back as to what went wrong, right, and then reflect and say, well, what could I have done differently? Like today, I was playing Escape from Tarkov, and I pushed someone and they had the better position and i decided that i was going to hip fire instead of aim down sight mm-hmm. and it cost me uh, my my life in the game yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i and immediately like as soon as it happened i was like i should have aimed down sight why didn't i aim down sight <laughs> it, it's it's just stuff like this that like you can do the same thing in this game like why did i put my my guys right here they they just got shot off the board like why didn't i put them over here behind this piece of terrain why didn't I set them up for success, right? So I, I think a lot of people don't self-reflect sometimes. And I know it can be hard because it's the heat of the moment, right? Yeah. So, but yeah. Not only heat of the moment, but people find escape goods. Yeah. Right? Because they don't want to take responsibility that you could have done something wrong. And it's like a little harsh for me to say, like, but in reality, somebody who just blames a dice or only blames the fact that their codex doesn't have a new codex, right? Is seems to be putting a lot of blame on stuff that they have no control over. Mm-hmm. And if you put blame on things you don't have control over in a shifting meta, you're literally taking the power away from yourself and not being able to sort of like do anything about it, yeah. right? You're not giving yourself agency or the power to really tackle the problem. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's like uh, bringing it back to like w- with Admech, you know, you have your sterilizers that just got nerfed and then there's probably going to be people out there just like, oh, dang it, man. Like, what the heck? Like, that was so, it was so good. What do you mean it's nerfed now? Darn. Like, you, you know, there's going to be people like that. And then they're going to be saying like, oh, well, now the army isn't as broken. It's not as good anymore. But that's not true. You still have your, you still have your chicken walkers. <laughs> you still have your last cannons. You know, mm-hmm. you still yeah. have so much stuff that you can use in a meta that's just constantly changing all the time. I mean, like what every month now, uh, there's like a new FA. No, not a new FA. Yeah, there's like a new FAQ. I think every month this year has there been a new FAQ. 
Usually an FAQ for a book Maybe? comes out two to three weeks after the book is released. Yeah. yeah. And then they do that, you know, they, they, they did like the, the point values and the GT mission pack and they kind yeah. of released FAQs in conjunction with that. Yeah, but the GT but, mission pack was kind of like the same mission packs. So yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, all the it missions was, at least. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. was, they, they really didn't change like anything. Yeah. Um, which it was a bit of a wah wah moment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, GW now, don't even get me started on GW like 10 Before. years ago. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just, you know, back then you had a busted codex like Admech, mm -hmm. right? It would have been like four years. Yeah. Before you, before you get Admech a new one. Codexes yeah. where you would go to a tournament and like 80% of people would have been playing Admech. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it was, it, yes. Nice. Yeah. And like now that the game is like constantly having more and more updates, more so than what people are like complaining about. No, there's a lot of people that say that the game doesn't get updated a lot, but I think that it does. Mm -hmm. Especially now with new codexes coming out, like we're still getting new codexes uh, almost like every single month, which is yeah. nice comparatively to the horror stories that I've heard. And like, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. You just have to wait like almost <laughs> yeah, a year. Like, yeah, or exactly years. what Scar was saying, right? Yeah. Um, so you have all these changes, but like, how do you. So how, how would you guys recommend these changes in the sense of like buying your models, right? So like you can have, and, and I'm not saying to purchase every single model in the army, unless you have the funds to do so and you want to, and you know, you know, have at it, but what's a good way for you to kind of like be ready on the dime when something is good to put it into your army. If it fits your play style, when it's all of a sudden good now, you know what I mean? I think one thing is to look at a unit and say, what is this going to score me on secondaries? I think that's one way to look at it. Like, mm -hmm. what is this going to do for me well, in well, the game? No, no, I'm saying, like, let's say that you have an 8th edition codex, right? right? And you're going to be transitioning into ninth edition, right. right? With your ninth edition codex. Yeah. How do you physically prepare for that, right? Like, how do you get ready for that? Like, Scar, when you... I know that you have the entire, like, Jakari lineup, right? You have, like, all the models in the army. But let's say that you didn't have all the models in your army. How would you have been prepared for them eighth edition to ninth edition to start hit to like hit the ground running to be able to go to your next event? So one of the things I started doing was I started playing with more varied lists leading up to the code exchange. Mm -hmm. So I started like experimenting with a bunch of different models and units just to get a feel for them, you know. And and a lot of the times, like we we live in an edition or in an, in an age where you can, you know stuff on for example like tabletop simulator yeah for example right so like access to models and stuff you you can practice and things or see if that's something that you want to get right mm -hmm. um you know staying on top of like the rumor boards or whatever you can kind of like get an idea of what people think is going to be good or bad but to be honest i think that's like the that's sort of like the wild factor when it comes to building a list mm -hmm. you know i mean like if you you can't really go out and pre-buy a bunch of stuff to prepare, quote-unquote, for the meta. Mm -hmm, because, yeah. you know, you might go out and go, you know what, this, this, you know, it's like, let's call it Jar Jar Binks syndrome, right? <laughs> Jar Jar Binks is going to be the best character in all of Star Wars. <laughs> you know, get a tattoo down your back. Or <laughs> and then it, they're, they're not, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so you kind of have to, like, bring it in a way. And I feel like it's more like, look at your play style and go, what's fast? What's tanky? What's killy like now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of go, what sort of suits my play style? You know, yeah. I might want another unit of fast moving stuff because I like a fast moving army, or I might need another tanky like HP unit that can just sit there and take hits. Yeah, and you kind of right? yeah, and you because that's my look. play style, right? So you can kind of invest on that, and then you kind of gamble at that point. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I hope they're good, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. you kind of you kind of look at the model, and you're just like, this guy looks tanky. Maybe in the <laughs> next codex, he'll be tanky. I mean, I'll pick him up. Maybe let's see. <laughs> what about you, Demeki? Like, how do you uh, deal with having? Because you went from an you, you, all of your armies went from an eighth edition yeah. to a ninth edition codex now. <laughs> yeah, so well, like, I mean, like so, so, some of them. So like Death Guard. I, I don't even think I, did I get an eighth. I don't even did I get an eighth edition game in with Death, Death Guard Word? before ninth. Yeah. Oh yeah, the tournament. Yeah, uh, dude, I completely forgot. But the, the, to honest to God, the army play is completely different. It feels like mm -hmm. like it's the same, but like a lot of changes. Like things the units that were good are no longer good. Like yeah. uh, the guy that has the bell. I forgot his name already. The Blightbringer. Yeah. Um. 
in eighth edition, he was amazing because you would roll an extra dice for an advance. Mm -hmm. And now it's just plus one to your advance. Mm -hmm. So, like, now for what his cost is, it's just like, well, why am I going to bring him? He's, he's not that great. I can just bring more foul blight spawn. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, then, but then you ran into the problem where like now, and this is like something that you, uh, another thing that you can't really control is what, like, you know, you see your new codex, right? right. You get it and yeah. you don't have the models and then you go yeah. online to find the models and they're not there. And guess what? They're <laughs> all sold out. Yeah. So like, do, do, do you guys like prepare before your ninth edition codex drops? Like, do you guys try to purchase more models uh, and have like a reservoir of models ready for you for when uh, uh, your ninth edition codex comes out or when a new update is coming out that you think is going to be really, really big? I think, I think one thing that I was doing as a new player was just kind of like grabbing like almost one of each just to be like, oh, maybe I can just give these a try. And then if I like the way that they play, then I'll buy more, right? And maybe go to the rule of three. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's still kind of that way, but now like certain things I will buy three of, like I saw three play burst. I saw play burst crawlers. I wanted three of them cause they look cool. That, and that's the cool factor. That's not even the knowledge of like how they're, how they're used or played in the game. Yeah. Um, but we're, we're your defilers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what about that? Huh? <laughs> every that, every that time that I try to buy one, they're <laughs> sold, sold out. out. What a, <laughs> I, so, so like, I mean, and then that comes down to, well, if I really want to play test or, or use a defiler, maybe reach out to, to someone. But if I'm going to play test it to see if it fits on my list, then, you know, I'm going to use my, my, the tools that I have available either by proxying or uh, playing on TTS. Mm -hmm. What about you, Scary? Another, Another thing to to keep in mind is in in terms of like and to tackle the met cha tackling the changing meta with like fluctuating like you know stock yeah. supply yeah basically mm -hmm. go out of your way to find the little stores in the middle of nowhere yes the little local mom and pop the shops. little yeah. local mom and pop game shops that have been carrying Warhammer for like. 10 20 years or mm -hmm. 30 years or whatever that are literally in like the little towns in your surrounding area mm -hmm. because a lot of the times they will have stock of stuff that's very popular mm -hmm. that they just don't have the traffic at their store yes. so i have found many a quote-unquote sold out mega box right at a little like hole in the wall shop because they got like 10 of them and they were never able to sell them yeah right yeah. um you know and that's that's something and of course you know especially with like these times you know like it's good to find little shops and support them and keep them around and stuff like that but i mean that's that's one of, that's like it's more of like a fringe way of doing it but mm -hmm. that's you know yeah or wait till the next code it comes out comes out and then just be patient wait for like if you needed racks with liquefier guns, now's your time to buy them on eBay, right? Yeah. Because, you know, it literally was a fad for like two months and then it got FAQ to burnt out and maybe you want to use them now, right? Or you just need racks. So then you can buy them off people who are just unloading them because they want to buy AdMech now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, you kind of you prey on the people that are switching uh, armies all the time. Yeah. And you're just yeah. kind of like preying on them being like, hey, you know, these guys aren't good anymore. <laughs> want to hand them over to me? Want to hand them over? Want to hand them over? Because, like, because because I know that there are times when like you feel bad when you can't get a model that you really want. Like I remember uh, yeah. when um, the armored impendium came out, or yeah. the armored compendium. Yeah, armored compendium. Imperial. The Forge World book. Yeah, the Forge, yeah, the Forge World, World book. book. When yes. The, when the Forge yeah. World book came out, I remember when it came out. Uh, we and we got it, and like obviously we got it like what a week late because <laughs> because of GW, right? Um, so then you open up the book, and then you know I I saw like Dimas, right? And I mm -hmm. saw what like the Hyraduls, and I was like, oh my god, these things these things are so cheap. You look at the Heritage, like oh my god, they're so cheap. I can run them now, like these, and like their profiles are great. I want to get them. The day that uh, you you finally see everything, and then you go online in order to buy it, and it's just like oh, all sold out. And then you don't get them <laughs> for like three, four months, and then like you start seeing everybody like, oh yeah, the Dima's really good, guys. It's really really, <laughs> and then you kind of feel bad because you can't get access to it because you didn't have access to the stock. Which obviously, like maybe it was because of COVID times. Yeah. So like, you know, it, it's not as uh, available, right? Yeah. 
Um, but I'm pretty sure, like, Scary, has that has that issue ever happened to you at all? Yeah, especially when I wanted to use, like, Mandrakes, like, NQI, Mandrakes. Mm -hmm. You know, there was some, like, key units that I was really excited about adding some more into my list, and they've just been sold out, right? Like, hard to get. Or, like, Reva Jet Bikes and Hellions. Yeah. Like, I found, I walked into, A, a little local game shop that doesn't have a lot of foot traffic, and there was a box of Hellions. I was like, snag. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> I was able to get myself a Gangs of Kamara box, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For, like... Yo, there's nine, there's six, there's six Reaper jet bikes and 10 Hellions in that box. Amazing, right? Like it was, you know, little finds like that. Um, yeah, so, so I've, I have found stuff like that. Of course, at the same time as a, as a hobbyist at heart, mm -hmm. I always recommend like give, your, give yourself a chance at potentially like converting some models. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Getting into using green stuff and mm -hmm. bits from the bits box. 3D printing you know, uh, stuff. Kit bashing yeah. stuff. Yeah, like there's right? lots of different ways like, to do it. Mm -hmm. there's, there's different ways to do it. And a lot of times the rule of cool will apply, even in like a tournament. Mm -hmm. Like if you put the effort into making a Dima out of a Trigon and a Carnifex and some green stuff, and you kind of made it the same shape, it might not be the same thing, but be like, hey, Mr. Tournament Organizer, you know, like... I can't like you might not fly like a big event, right? But yeah. you could be like, I can't buy a Dima. I'd like to try it. It's the right base. It's the right size. It's you know, it's like I've measured it or whatever. I kind of use this as a Dima. I've converted it and I painted yeah. it and it doesn't look like shit. Yeah. So and then a lot of times people will be like, yeah, sure. You put the effort into it, and then you can kind of use that as like a stand-in until you can get the actual model. Yeah, almost like of, a, almost a like a, a proxy, a, a glorified almost. proxy, almost. Yeah. yeah. Yep. As long as there's like work and effort, like not you're not putting a pop can on the table and being like this is a Dima, you know, like you put yeah, some, yeah, yeah. you put you're some hard and soul a, into yeah, it. you're not putting a freaking uh, a, a Coca Cola on the table and being like, hey guys, Morty. I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad you're happy though about the Forge World book because yeah. I remember looking through it and I was like, everything got worse. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like it's it's the same thing that people are running into now. You yeah. know, like like I like you know with the topic of this podcast talking about like the, an ever changing meta with things like uh what is it contemptors with volkite yep right everybody wants it it's like what volkite uh the volkite guns you can't find them anywhere and people are trying to find different ways to like i have build the bodies it. yeah yeah people have, the, have the bodies but they don't have the guns <laughs> but everybody wants to run it mm -hmm. like at that point when you see something like that how do you guys feel like do you guys think that you should keep trying to chase those things and then do the 3d printing or like well obviously you know if you go to a GW World, you can't do that anymore. But like, if you go to like a uh, 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 like kit bashing or anything like that in order to get those weapons and stuff, like, do you yeah. still go for that or do you ditch it and try to go come up with like your own way to play against uh, 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 that meta? But like, I guess like the contemporary kind of fills in a different yeah aspect for that army. Like, it actually right. fills in a void. But yeah, like, how do you deal with something like that when it's just not going to be available anytime soon, and you feel like that's going to get uh, points increased or changed or eroded in some way in the near future. Try to find the next best thing. Or, um, I mean, well, it's like the, the contemptors, like I have the contemptors and I have the Volkite arms because like, yeah, I mean, everybody's trying to do it. It's, it's part of a meta, but that like that particular meta doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to play it. Uh, it it's cool. I mean, I, I like it. The contemptors are a sick model. Uh, since I can't get my hands on the Volkite arms, then my options are to like 3D print it or uh, kit find some, kit bash it, whatever. Uh, but like, it, am I going to stop? No. Because like even if even if the they do something and it makes the Volkites worse or not as good, uh, then I can just follow the model away, right, until something else, so, until like either I find another way uh, that that model can can work, or uh, I use it for another game style, right? Another another a different type of game. Like I don't this like every model that I purchase, I purchase with the intent of use, or yeah, with with the intent of use some sometime down the line. Like mm -hmm. maybe not as like my meta. Uh, but like maybe, I mean, because for what we do, like, we're not always trying to, to do meta, right. We're, we're doing fluffless and stuff all the time, but, uh, 
like when it comes to me going to a tournament, if I have a model that's not like that, that's not going to fit a meta for a tournament. Yeah, I won't run it, but like, or I may not run it, but like, I'm not going to sell the model. I'll keep it. Yeah. What about you, Scary? I think as hobbyists, we are very creative individuals. Mm -hmm. So we will find a way. If we really want a model to put into our list, we find a way. Yeah. Now it also, that's, it's, it's sort of like this is a point where it's the community sort of ends up splitting. You have people who are very, very competitive, like meta chasers, mm -hmm. and they will pay top dollar for pieces they need. They'll go out of their way. They'll trade. They'll beg. They'll like recast. They'll whatever it is they need to like. And I'm talking like back in the day when you needed like 20 rocket launchers for your space wolves, you mm -hmm. literally built your own like mold and like cast like a hundred rocket launches at home, right? Like yeah. for yourself and for your army. Like that was, so we're, we're, we're creative in that way and we'll find a way. But the hobbyist might wait. They'll be like, well, wait till it's in stock and I'll just get it. Or you're on a Forge World waiting list or whatever. Mm. You know, I for one, I believe if you want to play a game, you support the people who make the game mm -hmm. so they continue to make cool stuff, under, like number one. But number two, I'm not against like kit bashing with different bits. So yep. if, like, you need, like, a resin bit or whatever that helps the main core of your army, like, change it up or convert it or whatever, like, you, it's a hobby art project. Yeah, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, an, it's literally a, your baby. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. if you want that Contemptor to be, like, a Nurgle Contemptor Dreadnought, then that Volkite can literally be a great number of undesirable and indescriptable weapon type things that you could put on a dreadnought that's corrupted by chaos mm. right so you could literally just make it your own yeah you, you convinced me i'm cutting my contemptor dreadnought in half and then when i eventually get a defiler i'm putting the <laughs> top half on the bottom <laughs> half and vice versa <laughs> there you go so then you can flip yeah. it one way yeah. or the other yeah, and then yeah. one game is the contemptor and one oh, game is, is the, the <laughs> defiler <laughs> It's like an inside-out jacket. Just, yeah. just a, a, a reversible jacket. Yes. You're, you're ready for anything. <laughs> All right. I think that that is going to be it for this episode. Uh, we're going to end it off here. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, Skari, please plug yourself in every way that you would wish to be plugged. That sounds weird. Please do As a Dark plug. Eldar player, that sounded more like a Friday night. Yeah, it sounds like a good <laughs> so, weekend. Like a good time. No, uh, thank you so lot for having me. Once again, uh, Chapter Tactics and Frontline Gaming Network crew, I really appreciate it. You can find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash scardcast, which is also the blog. So I put up like uh, bat reps, I put up articles, and you know, like army lists, 40k army lists. And of course, the whole Denizen community is on there as well as the exclusive Discord and stuff. So thank you. I really appreciate it. That's the plug. That's the, whole, the only plug I need uh, well, today. Um, excuse me. What about the podcast that you do every single week on your Twitch oh, channel? Oh, my goodness gracious me. Yeah, I do a live show on Twitch. So that's on twitch.tv slash scardcast. That's every Tuesday through Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to be wrapping up season one of the Just Put Paint on It show uh, by mid-August. Mm -hmm. So we're coming to the end, but we've, got, we've had great guests on, and it's a, like an hour and a half show where we sit, we chat, we hobby, and sometimes just put paint on it. Yeah, talk about seedless watermelons. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, if you guys want to <laughs> check out some more, Frontline Gaming Podcast, you guys can check out youtube.com forward slash nix that. Uh, that's not true. Uh, it's not <laughs> because I was going to say Frontline Gaming, but it's actually the URL isn't Frontline Gaming. But if you guys want to check out more Frontline Gaming stuff and more Frontline Gaming Podcasts, you can go and check out frontlinegaming.org where you can get all of your stuff there. If you guys enjoy Chapter Tactics, please check out uh, patreon.com forward slash chapter tactics where you can help support this podcast. Also, if you guys like us uh, at Dice Check, you guys can check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Dice Check, where we upload battle reports and also lots of other stupid videos that you guys can help numb your brain. It'll be fun. Uh, we also do battle reports every single Saturday at twitch.tv forward slash Dice Check. And that's also where you can check out Chapter Tactics, streamed live to everybody. 
on the Twitch channel. And uh, we have a pre-show and a post-show where we talk to chat and answer questions and have fun and have a good time. So, yeah, thank you guys for joining us on episode 209 of Chapter Tactics. And goodbye, everybody. Have a good night. Bye-bye, Nene. Bye. Bye, you. Bye.